I love how Saranya <laughs> read those lines. I have him already. I had underlined here, written out. I wasn't supposed to be here yet in the talk, but we'll see how it's going to unfold now. A, a phrase that I wrote down from a talk of Yogananda, listening to him, and his words were, but spoken, I should almost call Saranya back up here to read it. It was so well done. I don't want to hear any of you moaning, he said. When will I find God? As if your own answer to that question were never. You have God already. And you can imagine him booming it, uh, just like from the reading. You need only to live in that consciousness, uh, which, of course, is true. It's exactly what Jesus was saying here and what Swamiji so uh, beautifully expounds on. But it's so hard for us. It's so incredibly difficult to get out of the mind that is asking that question, when, 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 and just to be here now. That's why Master's definition of self-realization is so beautiful, where he says uh, self-realization is the knowing in all parts of body, mind, and soul that we are already in possession of the kingdom of God, that God's omnipresence is our omnipresence, that we don't need to um, learn anything more to know that. What we need to do is improve our knowing. And again, not so easy. How is it that we can just be in the moment? I had uh, an amazing experience about a year ago. It was very personal, but I'll share it with you right now because it was, in fact, a universal experience that we could all learn from. As many of you know, because I look around, there's a lot of familiar faces. Uh, I did know Swami Kriyananda. I, in fact, came to Ananda in 1980. That was a long time ago. But for many reasons, which are outside of this talk right now, I was not one of those people who was always with Swamiji. And it wasn't until I was with him, but not the group who would be having dinner with him and listening to his books as he wrote them, where he was asking for edits, any of that. That wasn't mine. Years later, Swamiji because I think he could see what was coming, would spend more time with me, give me more energy. Never came like that. It wasn't like, Shanti, sit down. I want to teach you something. In fact, I'm still learning. I really do have that experience. Oh my goodness, that's why he did that, or that's what he meant. But I think that's the way the great saints teach us. But one time, about a year ago, I was meditating, and this is a year ago. I'm almost 76. I'm about to leave, and this is just coming clear for me now. And I was sitting in front of my altar. When I came out of meditation, I came out with a knowing. It's, it's hard to put these things into words, but with tears coming down my face, Swamiji loves me. He loves me. And it wasn't as if somebody else, anybody else loved me. It was an experience in my heart that was so deep and so all-encompassing and profound because he was holding me in that universal love that state of consciousness that is love. And it just changed the course of the rest of my life so far. And I feel like that will only go deeper. But I share it because the title of this reading, The Eternal Now, 
It's almost like an oxymoron. How can those words go together? And yet, many of us have the great good karma to be sitting here, even if we don't live in it all the time. We can really grasp the feeling of that. We can under understand, not with our mind, but perceive with our heart that in the instant that we know true love, in that moment that was gifted to me, but as Saranya said, as, as Master said, Yudhishthira was talking about it this morning during the fire ceremony. It is the truth for all of us. There is nothing we have to do to feel God's love and God's presence, to, which is the exact same thing as being in the eternal now. But open our hearts to it. Get out of our minds. Because interestingly, our hearts have the ability to perceive things in truth that our minds can't do. Our hearts, in fact, Swamiji has said to us, are instruments of perception. They are, in fact, and this is our heart chakra, of course, our, the energy of the heart in our astral spine is where we can know truth, not with our minds. So when we open up to that love, to that extraordinary power of God's presence, we know something that we could not have known any other way. Lakshmi and I went to Yosemite this week. We drove up Thursday morning. We hiked around the valley four or five miles just to acclimate ourselves a little bit. We slept there. And then the next day, we got up and we hiked what is called the Mist Trail. Now, that was a misnomer this year. I promise you, it was not misty. We were literally being almost swept off our feet with these sheets of icy cold water because it's this monumental year, which is why we went at some point on this hike, which is, it's a serious hike. It's only 1,000 feet up, but it's these big steps carved out of the rock. So for 1,000 feet, you're climbing steps. You'll have to take my word for it. It's not a simple walk. <laughs> and at some point, Lakshmi, and I could not have done the hike without her. It's about seven miles round trip. We didn't come down the steps. We took a longer route down. But it's, it's, it's a challenging seven miles. So God bless her. She helped me do that hike for what I imagine will be the last time in this life, but it was the perfect time. And she looked at me at one point. We're, we're in the middle of just getting blasted. And she said to me, this is almost not fun. <laughs> it was so funny. But you know, you can't help but feel Yosemite is so, uh, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary beyond words, beyond imagination of expectancy, which is, of course, why John Muir had the experiences that he did there. And I mean, we've all heard of him. He was remarkable. He, the more I read everything he wrote, and I wanted to come here with 10 quotes of his, but I doubt I'll get to them, but he, he found God in, in nature. He literally experienced God. And at one point, he said he was contemplating a petal of a flower. I don't have the exact quote, but a petal of a flower. And he said, I realized in that moment that it took all of the force of the universe to create that petal and that everything that is God was in that one flower petal. 
And it really is the truth because God is everything. Because this is what Yogananda meant when he said, center everywhere, circumference nowhere. So whether it's a flower petal or it's us, or it was this just absolutely indescribable scene at Yosemite this year. I want to say to everybody, if you have even one day off this week, go, because you just you won't see it probably again. I mean, we know that. Where is all that water coming from? I shared with Lakshmi a story. I don't remember it's the first time I did the mist trail or not, but I was with Barry, my partner, and it was the first time he had done the mist trail. And for those of you that don't know it, you're hiking right up along these waterfalls. And before you get to the first fall, which is pretty high up, which is Vernal Fall, you come to this bridge. So all of the water that's coming down from Nevada Fall through Vernal Fall that's coming out of the mountains and out of the ground that's holding the moisture. You're standing on a bridge, and all of this water is flowing under you, but it's and you're, you're looking at it. It's behind you and in front of you, but you're very close to it. And I remember Barry was just holding on to the railing there, and he didn't want to move, and I that was just like the beginning of the hike. I think it must not have been my first time because I knew we still had a ways to go, including getting soaking wet. But I was trying to encourage him to keep moving. And he was just bound there. And he said, I feel so potent. And I knew just what he meant. He was having an experience of God's presence in the form of power, spiritual power. It, it's beyond words. So here was somebody who wasn't necessarily starting on this hike thinking about God, but who was having an experience of the divine, of the eternal now, right in that moment. And he did not want to move on. And I understood we did move on. We did make it to the top of the hike. But we, we rested for a while. It's everywhere. It's all, it's here. We are living in the eternal now. And Swamiji speaks about this so beautifully. He says, in a way, he said, it's just the human experience in a broader uh, explanation of the reading, he said, we all come in. He said, a farmer plants a seed. And if there's the right sunlight, if there's the appropriate amount of water, if the soil is good, eventually, whatever you've planted will grow. But you can't rush the process. You cannot change the time of that. We live in this outward dimension of time he said, no matter what we do, it takes the moon a month to do its cycle. He doesn't say this next, but I will. You can be hiking or walking, and you can have a sliver of a moon, and you can want that moon to be full. But you can't demand that it's full. You have to wait until it happens. We have to wait for the Earth to make its full rotation around the sun. Everything in the physical world has its time, and we're used to thinking like that. However, the eternal now does not exist in that consciousness. It exists in a consciousness that has nothing to do with time. It has to do with being precisely in the moment. This is what happened to John Muir so many years ago. He knew God was there. And then this um, will in him that kept coming up that says, I have to help preserve this so that everyone can come 
so that everyone can know. I'll read you the most. One quote of his where he says, this is, he lived for months by himself in these mountains, sometimes without even a blanket. You know, you can, those mountains are rugged. You can only do that if you are perfectly in tune with something. If you're perfectly in tune with it, it cannot hurt you. You realize you are one with it. It's not hot and cold. Uh, I had to laugh when I was listening to the affirmation, weightless waterfalls bringing us to peace. And I thought these were not weightless waterfalls. But if we would get in tune with them, they would still bring us there. But he says, reading these grand mountain manuscripts, he's reading the mountains, displayed through every vicissitude of heat and cold, of calm and storm, of upheaving volcanoes and grinding, down grinding glaciers, we see that everything in nature called destruction must be creation, a change from beauty to beauty. Isn't that beautiful? He just, he knew. He was just resting right in the middle. That wasn't unique to him. That is the experience. And we can find it anywhere. Last night, Lakshmi and I drove out to uh, Clayton, where we gave a service for them, this service. And when, you, when you're sitting there in Roberto and uh, Rita's backyard, many of you know them, it's exquisite. And, it, and that's where they have the service outdoors. And it was only last night for the first time, I'm embarrassed to say, coming with the consciousness out of Yosemite, living in that, that I realized that when you're there and you're giving the talk, what you're looking at is Mount Diablo, which on a perfectly clear evening, which it was yesterday, is so beautiful. And I, it just brought me back into that place that I was just in the day before in Yosemite. And then I was sitting here this morning, and I was looking at that picture of Master and Swamiji. And I love that picture where Swamiji's offering up the light to Yogananda. And I just felt that happen again. And I thought, there are temples around us everywhere. You can walk into any number of temples and have that experience of God. But we forget. We just forget. I told a little story last night that I heard Dave Varshi tell that I'll share now. It's, it's sort of a silly story, but nonetheless, you'll get it and you'll probably laugh. <laughs> but uh, there's a man standing on the river, and he's watching the river, and it's raging. And he needs to get across to the other side. He thinks he does, but he can't see a way over to the other side. He's looking this way in the river, that way he can't see. But suddenly, he sees a man on the other side of the river. And he yells across, and he says, how do I get to the other side? And the man stops, and the man looks up the river, and he looks down the river, and then he looks across the river at the man, and he does this, and he says, you're already on the other side. <laughs> we don't know where we are. We forget, and we have been given the most remarkable tools. You know, this coming Wednesday, I think, is International Day of Yoga. Um, it's relatively new, and it's perfect. It was declared like eight years ago, 10 years ago. I don't remember exactly. And I was thinking, most people, because we're doing a, an event in Mountain View that day, we would like to see all of you there at, I think, 5.30 or something. Lakshmi will announce it soon. But most people are talking about Hatha Yoga when they talk about the International Day of Yoga. And people will be doing postures everywhere. And so will we, by the way. There will be people leading them. 
But what we know, what we've been handed, are these extraordinary tools to truly experience yoga, to experience union with all that is. Now, the postures are important because they set us up to uh, move into this space. I mean, they are part of Patanjali's Eightfold Path. And he talks about postures as a means of being able to sit perfectly still. Why? To continue moving through the other aspects of his path all the way to samadhi. That's where Patanjali takes us. And Patanjali's teachings are our teachings, of course. But what a gift that we know that. What a gift that we understand that we're on our way, that it makes sense that many of us have been handed Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga is one of the best tools, the best tool, Yogananda would say, ever given to mankind to help us traverse this path that will take us to that place where we can experience the divine. We're not just doing Hatha Yoga. You know, when um, India's president was talking about International Day of Yoga, and he was talking, I forget how many tens of thousands of Indians were in that moment practicing Hatha Yoga, and he was announcing it. But he said in that talk, he said practicing Hatha Yoga and only doing that would be like tuning your instrument for the rest of your life, but never playing the song. What we want to do is we want to be playing the music, hearing the music, experiencing the music. And the music is Om. The music is our connection to the divine. It's why we feel what we feel with Swami Kriyananda's music, because beyond words, it takes us there. It's another gift that we've all been given, that we listen to this, and the very vibration just takes us where we need to go. It brings us to the heart, to the heart, through the heart chakra. It shows us what we can learn there, the heart as an instrument of perception, which is intuition. It's divine knowledge. And then Swamiji takes this reading from Jesus, but which every great teacher, every great teacher has some way of referring to this point between the eyebrows because it's a real thing. It's not just for one religion or one sect or, no, it's the, it's the truth. I was telling them last night that I was thinking of, but I'm not going to do it, having us listen to and watch the visuals of Swami Kriyananda reading Yogananda's poem, Samadhi. Yogananda sat on the subway in New York City going back and forth and back and forth. And he wrote the poem Samadhi, which just says that when you're with God, you're with God. You don't really have to be walking the mist trail. But for some of us, it helps. Or looking at Mount Diablo. Really, when you know how to get there, you can get there. The poem is, of course, profound. It's the most profound experience we could have. And the visuals that it's been set to by somebody at Ananda with Swami Kriyananda, who was so perfectly in tune with Yogananda, that listening to him read that poem, and you, this is, uh, you don't have to feel like, why is she not playing it? You can just find it on the internet, Swami Kriyananda reading the poem Samadhi, perfectly in tune, so you understand lines. You understand them with your heart. You suddenly know what this most profound expression of spirituality means. And you feel 
uplifted closer and closer to that experience when you listen to Swami Kriyananda read it. But the visual, very early on in it, they have an image of a tunnel of white light that is so beautiful. And at the end of that tunnel is this star that we all want to go into. That is the goal. That is why we're sitting here this morning. That is why we meditate. It is why we become initiated into Kriya Yoga. It is why we do all of what we do. We're headed to that star. And if you watch that on the visual with the vibration of Swamiji's voice guiding you, you feel so drawn into that light. If you're not ready for it, it can be a little frightening. And you see that star. And if your mind quiets, you understand your eyes are uplifted. Swamiji said in the reading, when you go deep in meditation, your eyes will naturally lift up. Yes, we can use it as a tool. Lift up thine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh the light. But that will naturally happen. It's a natural state of all of the energy in our astral spine that is waiting to be freed to go there. And I realized as I was watching that video yesterday that it's a way for us to practice. Watch the video. Look at the tunnel of light. Look at the star. And when we sit to meditate or to just be quiet, do what Jesus is asking us to do. Lift our eyes and imagine until it happens for you that you're going through that tunnel of light. Just let yourself be uplifted and into that star because that's what Jesus said. Why would you say, I'm going to wait four months to do the harvest or six months or tens of thousands, if not millions, of lifetimes, which is what we all do. Why wait? We can, right now, the eternal now, it's right here. All we need to do is improve our knowing. Let's see. Let's take a moment of silence. Mm -hmm. 